Though he had three months of experience with the highway police, Clifford Donahue had not accomplished anything particularly notable, spending his time reading Rex Stout's writings. This young, aspirational man dreamed of becoming a top investigator. Regretfully, these hopes stayed only dreams. Clifford had not discovered any hazardous offenders over his employment. Rather, he became the laughing stock for the precinct since his other cops thought his investigating abilities were ridiculous. Just glance at this Pinkerton. One finds oneself laughing at him. They would say, insulting his little build, he is not a cop and never will be. Clifford chose not to display his co-workers and supervisors' anger. Although he felt it, he concentrated on his responsibilities. Resolved to eventually bring himself pride, Clifford never let himself unwind while on duty and remained alert always with this in mind. He was on this specific day at his post attentively watching the passing cars. Clifford felt as though the traffic would never stop since the stream of trucks, pickups, and minivans appeared limitless. His primary responsibility was making sure nobody in his part of the road violated the speed limit. Occasionally, he would stop dubious vehicles for inspection. His peers never stopped gassing at his fervor. Clifford halted an unusual pickup vehicle loaded with plastic bins one week earlier. Clifford's misgivings were heightened when he questioned the driver about the contents. Seeing danger, Clifford demanded reinforcements, much to the dispatcher's amusement. Soon backup showed up on the scene, demanding that he open the canisters. The young police was gun pointing the pickup truck owner. Clifford's fertile mind had already envisioned several possibilities, including gold, contraband imported from Latin America, or illegally obtained jewels. Clifford handled things personally when the driver would not to open the crates. Imagine Clifford's astonishment upon learning the containers housed several dozen snakes. The driver reportedly loved these reptiles and caught them to open a private herpetarium. In instinct, poor Clifford withdrew in terror which set off his colleague's laughing explosion. As it happened, the Ford driver had not engaged in any criminal activity, which gave the other police still another excuse to ridicule Clifford. All they could do was acknowledge the truth and let the enthusiast for snakes go peacefully. Following that episode, Clifford became known as a failing investigator and a hopeless loser. He felt somewhat uneasy about this attitude, but he had no way he could make things better. Clifford stayed as alert and exact as usual despite the regrettable occurrence with the containers. Thus, the officer's heart started to race frantically when he saw a black Cadillac on the road. For some reason he felt strange about this car. Clifford's suspicions were first aroused by the Cadillac's obvious hearse function, shown by the dark, melancholy color and the typical drapes on the windows. Clifford waved for the Cadillac to stop as he left the patrol car. Good noon. Sir, is there anything I did wrong? Just give me a ticket if I did, the driver remarked right away. Hardly having opened the door, trying to overlook the driver's obvious anxiety, Clifford nodded and introduced himself. The man behaved as a guilty cat trying to avoid blame, with close-set eyes that tracked Clifford's every action as though there was anything to conceal. The owner of the Cadillac seemed quite odd. He wished for the police to never discover what he was concealing. What are you transporting? Clifford inquired as he looked at the license plate of the car. What do you suppose a hearse may be carrying? Sir, it's a coffin. Naturally, the driver replied right away. I have to carry it to the cemetery, and they'll take care of it there. Clifford stopped to consider. There was one discrepancy in the driver's explanation, though it seemed reasonable enough. Why is he alone if he's carrying it to the cemetery? The funeral procession is where? The officer questioned if the dead had any relations. So, may I leave, officer? The driver, clearly worried, remarked, I'm sure they're waiting for me there already. Clifford had a gut feeling that something wasn't right, but he was scared to make another mistake and face scorn from his peers because of what happened with the unlucky containers. He made the decision to manage the matter alone rather than calling for assistance as a result. You mentioned the coffin? Can you let me see inside? Returning the driver's documents, Clifford inquired, the Cadillac's owner tensed visibly, then steadied himself and said, of course you can, but why would you want to? With caution, nothing much to see, just a drunken man, to be honest, 
It doesn't look very nice. Disregarding the driver's recommendation, Clifford unlocked the Cadillac's rear door. It was a coffin, after all, and it appeared to be one of the less expensive ones. With caution, Clifford lifted the lid and peered inside. He didn't expect to see what he did at that precise moment. Clifford's mind was already racing with ideas of apprehending a jeweler and smuggler who was utilizing the casket to carry weapons. He imagined his picture in the local paper with a caption explaining how he had so valiantly apprehended the deadly criminal. He imagined himself in the limelight, surrounded by innumerable camera flashes, doing interviews, and soaking in the glory. But as soon as Clifford opened the casket, all of it was revealed to be nothing more than a fantasy. Much to his dismay, there was a real dead person. Actually, it was a dead woman, an old woman of maybe 70. Her complexion was strangely pink, as though she'd passed away just an hour before. Nothing seemed particularly out of the ordinary at first. Clifford later found out, though, that the driver had lied to him on purpose. It was actually an elderly woman. Despite his claim that it was an alcoholic male, what's the situation here? Was that a genuine error on his part? Or did he lie to me on purpose? Clifford pondered. The officer found all of this to be somewhat unusual. To tell the truth, Clifford had never seen a funeral procession like this one before. Usually, there were three or more automobiles. But this time, there was just one Cadillac. And the driver was grumpy and shifty. Clifford couldn't let the driver leave even though he knew he might be mistaken since he had a strange feeling. He shivered as he pushed the coffin lid aside and softly caressed the dead woman's hand. Dear Lord, she's warm. The driver hit Clifford in the head with a tire iron at that same moment. Interrupting Clifford's flow of thought, Clifford lost consciousness, and his world went black. The attacker forced the unconscious cop inside the car and slammed the door shut because the road was quite empty. Clifford now laid next the old woman's casket the one he felt might still be alive. After taking a brief glance around, the driver got into the car and accelerated in the direction of the city cemetery. Clifford needed some time to come to as well. He received a concussion from the great force of the tire iron blow. He felt a dreadful weakness all over his body, like if he were floating on waves of misery, sometimes rising out from the depths to grab a breath of fresh air. Just to plummet again into the pit of suffering, though Clifford wasn't sure if he was still alive or had already moved over to another world. The Cadillac's continuous motion persuaded him he was in fact alive. His body sensed the usual shocks of driving on a dirt road when he hung on the brink of awareness. Is he really taking me to the cemetery? The officer thought. Clifford's gut feeling was right when the automobile arrived at the city cemetery, the territory of the dead. Clifford, somewhat weak was unable to actively fight his abductor, who had also taken his service weapon. The driver got out of the car and looked over the dug grave. The driver was seasoned criminal Tony. The elderly woman resting in the casket had been poisoned with sleeping drugs by a criminal gang of realtors. Not dead, with a cunning and simple fraud, they sought to take her suburban house. They won their trust, then disposed of lonely senior householders steering clear of real violence. They came up with this clever way to get rid of the bodies. Acting as death, Clifford saw Tony dragging the coffin from the automobile into the grave. All Tony had to do now was bury the grave with earth and celebrate another great fraud. Tony, though, stopped for some reason. Clifford first didn't know why he stopped, but the police knew his plan when Tony started dragging him out of the car. Startled, Clifford said, Dear Lord, he wants to bury me alive next to the poor old woman. Not wanting to die, Clifford collected his last of strength and kicked the driver in the chest. Totally unprepared for this, the driver lost his equilibrium and staggered over the grave's edge. Falling in, he shattered his ankle on the wooden coffin lid because the fall was so unexpected and unpleasant. Clifford, staggered with nausea and vertigo, headed for the gatehouse, desperate swinging his arms. He sought to draw in any guests perhaps visiting the graveyard. The cemetery keeper spotted Clifford shortly and phoned for an ambulance and the police right away. Their community, let alone the state, has never seen anything like this. 
The narrative was so startling that the local media grabbed it right away and reported from every perspective. Clifford's alertness helped to expose a whole criminal network including multiple individuals. Among them Tony, which included drivers. Tony was the one almost buried Clifford and the elderly woman alive. The old woman's health seemed to be unaffected by the occurrence. Strangely, Amanda Bronson said, I haven't slept so soundly in a very long time, but I did have the strangest dream, once she came to. Clifford shook his bandaged head and looked about at his associates. He had assisted in the capture of a genuine criminal. First in his career, his precinct colleagues stopped laughing at him following this episode. Even a promotion came for him. They now discussed how Clifford had risked his life to neutralize a member of the infamous Black Realtors gang. Instead of the container accident, in his free time, Clifford started visiting Mrs. Bronson. The elderly woman always gave him to tea and homemade sweets. She could live in her own house and knew it was owing to Clifford she had not been buried alive. The tale of Clifford's bravery soon traveled outside of state boundaries. The story of the black realtors acquired details and embellishments never included in the original occurrence. Clifford, however, was unconcerned about any of that. He kept serving and defending the law as usual, though you wouldn't know for sure. Next time you're going down the highway Clifford could be waving at you from a patrol car. After watching the first story above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. Now, let's watch another similar story. Ohio, where Quentin Edwards was born and brought up, has a reputation as an agricultural powerhouse. Quentin learned early on to work hard when he helped out on the family farm. Regrettably, the meager earnings of his parents could never meet all the demands of farming. The soil wasn't very fertile. And there wasn't enough water to make it easy to cultivate crops like maize. This meant that the Edwards family really had to live hand to mouth. The frills that his more affluent contemporaries enjoyed were unavailable to Quentin. Despite living in constant poverty, the adolescent frequently fantasized about a brighter tomorrow. It was a tough choice. But Quentin had to make it because his family's income had already dropped significantly by the time he finished from high school. So he left for New York, like many of his peers. Quentin aspired to be wealthy when he was young, even though he had no idea what he wanted to do for a living or in what field, his friends and acquaintances convinced him to go to New York. Thankfully, he was able to secure a job at a metalworking assembly company very soon after. Thanks to this work, he was able to secure housing, put some money aside, and send a portion to his parents. Quentin was completely worn out by the time his shifts were over because of how hard the work was. He frequently slept off in the back seat of the bus on his way home, and his co-workers would have to wake him up when he reached his stop. On the other hand, Quentin once rode the bus alone since his regular co-worker was unwell and nobody else was available to fill in. In his drowsiness, Quentin nearly missed his stop because he wasn't paying attention. A soft tap on the shoulder prompted him to open his eyes. A young woman with long, wavy hair and piercing blue eyes stood before him. It seems this is your stop, the guy remarked. I see your point. What gave it away? With caution, Quentin inquired. For a while now, we've been riding shotgun on the same bus. Due to your constant slumber, you have never paid attention to me. I smiled and learned your stop because I get off at the next stop, the young woman said, later that night. Quentin knowingly disregarded his stop in order to keep conversing with the girl. Megan was her name and she was not from New York either, just like Quentin, they hit it off right away, ignoring the passing of time, they conversed for hours, they agreed to meet again the next day after saying their final goodbyes outside Megan's house, Megan and Quentin started seeing one other practically every day, after work, Quentin always made sure to accompany Megan on her walk home. Many were taken aback by how quickly their romance bloomed. Maybe this is the result of a passionate attraction between two people whose hearts are on fire. Megan and Quentin were married six months after they first met. Sarah was born five months after they were married. Sarah's parents instantly made her the center of their universe. With all of their time and care, Quentin and Megan gave their daughter the best possible childhood. 
the upwardly mobile family appeared to have at last discovered the happiness that so many people long for. Unfortunately, disaster sneaked in unobserved, as is often the case. Megan had been having stomachaches a lot, which she thought were caused by indigestion and tried to get better by eating a balanced diet, though that was partially untrue. Megan maintained she had no time and no one to watch Sarah despite Quentin's persistent requests for her to consult a doctor. Because Sarah was such a calm and intelligent youngster, Quentin had no trouble finding a babysitter for her. Megan's agony grew worse in the interim, she tried to tolerate it, but in the end, she turned to ibuprofen for comfort. While working in the kitchen one day, Megan became really sick. She fought to go to the phone to call for an ambulance because the pain was getting so bad. Upon arriving home from work, Quentin saw Sarah in tears, after grabbing his daughter. He hurried to the medical facility. A doctor encountered him in the lobby and broke the terrible news that Megan was seriously unwell. How come you waited for so long? You need to have arrived earlier. Treatment will be quite difficult at this stage of the malignancy, the physician said. Cancer. With a tone of skepticism, Quentin posed the question, Yes, but we'll exert every effort, I swear. The physician comforted him. Quentin found solace in the doctor's comments, which gave him optimism that everything would soon get back to normal. Once they left the doctor's office, he gave young Sarah his word that her mom would get better. The following day, Quentin and Sarah visited Megan in the hospital after purchasing a sizable arrangement of flowers. But when they arrived to the building, a nurse with tears streaming down her cheeks welcomed them. The nurse started, Mr. Edwards, we're very, very sorry. But your wife, with a stutter. What happened to my wife? Not wanting to believe the worst, Quentin cried out. It was revealed that Megan had died exactly one hour before to the arrival of her spouse and daughter. Daddy, Daddy, didn't you promise everything would be all right? Sarah began to cry, rendering Quentin mute. He was having a hard time getting through the funeral and the bizarre occurrences that followed. Quentin's suffering simply grew worse due to Sarah's unceasing crying, if it weren't for his daughter. He may have given up, but he had to take care of her. Even two years after Megan's passing, Quentin felt as though time had stopped. Every day, her remembrance tormented him, bringing back memories of their ideal collaboration. When he was really depressed, he would go to his room and cry by himself, keeping Sarah out of his tears. Quentin's three years were filled with grief and longing, but he found comfort in his work and became a highly competent professional. He kept taking the bus to work even though he didn't own a car. One afternoon, he went to his normal window seat and watched people go by while toting his personal items in packed lunch. He was surprised by a soft touch on his shoulder. He turned and saw an eight-year-old boy with cheeks smeared with tears and clothes ragged. Would you kindly offer me some cash? My stepfather drinks too much, and my mother passed away, the youngster lamented. His heart wrenched for the youngster. So Quentin decided to give him all of his money right away, reaching into his pocket. After giving the boy everything he had, Quentin was left with barely ten dollars. After a little hesitance, he retrieved his sandwiches and extended them to the youngster, and you, she asked, are you going to be hungry, what's wrong, the youngster inquired with apprehension, whatever, I'm accustomed to it. Yes, you may have it, you appear quite slim, Quentin smiled and responded, sobbing into his sleeve, the boy said, I'll make sure to pay you back, Quentin disapproved and groaned, he uttered the words of course, not realizing the boy's sincere belief in them. As soon as Quentin arrived at his station, he got off the train. He couldn't shake the image of the boy's face for quite some time. His failure to inquire about the boy's name was the thing that troubled him the most. Amidst the chaos of everyday life and obligations, the incident's recollection gradually faded as time went on. It seems like only yesterday that Sarah was playing with dolls, yet she grew up so fast, becoming a teenager apparently overnight. A new bike had been Sarah's lifelong ambition, and one day, after getting a bonus at work, Quentin decided to make her wish a reality. After waiting much too long, he finally bought Sarah a bike, and her happiness upon opening the package was contagious. When Sarah and her friends started going on bike rides, Quentin thought, 
It turns out you don't need much to be happy at 16. He was thrilled for Sarah since she could finally enjoy herself. There was no way anything could go wrong right then. Just one week after getting the bike, Sarah got in an accident, and Clinton was among the last to find out about it. Her rapid speed caused her to lose control, and she crashed to the ground, injuring her spine badly, at first. The seriousness of the situation eluded Quentin. Without uttering a word, Quentin grasped the seriousness of the situation as he beheld the doctor's look. Sarah was in critical need of surgery immediately to prevent a lifelong handicap. Please don't postpone the procedure, we still have time, the doctor said with a dropped gaze. When Quentin heard how much the procedure would cost, a knot of worry formed in his stomach. It would be impossible to pay for the operation and therapy even if he sold his home and all of his belongings, but Quentin was not going to give up. Over the following two years, he worked even harder, but he still couldn't save enough money. At the same time, Sarah continued to use a wheelchair, but she bloomed into a stunningly beautiful young woman. Sarah secretly wished she could be a model, but she had accepted the reality that she might never be able to do it while in a wheelchair. A knock on Quentin's door once jolted him out of his reverie. He gingerly opened the door, curious about the visitor, and saw a towering man in a suit standing there. Hello there, how may I be of service to you? Concerned that it could be a banker or a government figure, Quentin cautiously questioned. Sarah Rogers was the name the young man gave when he first spoke. His success was hinted at by the luxury automobile sitting outside. The reason for Sarah's visit became clear to Quentin when the young businessman presented him with a $10 bill out of the blue. Sarah was the youngster Quentin had helped out years ago, but it took him a second to remember him. Sarah had been through a lot since they last saw each other, and he often thought about the guy who had been so generous with his food and generosity. Sarah said that he had waited too long to start looking for Quentin because of his hectic schedule. In the face of adversity, Quentin kept plugging away at his idea, certain that he would eventually figure it out. Sarah wasted no time in stepping forward to help Quentin after hearing about his predicament. In Sarah's eyes, a flicker of optimism had returned. Sarah used a combination of a loan and the equity in his business to attract the large money that was required. Still, at that very second, he cared only for Sarah's well-being. Sarah had the operation a month later, and it went well. Her dad and Sarah were there every step of the way, even though Sarah humbly thought he was only paying it forward to the man who had rescued him 20 years earlier, he had become Sarah's actual guardian angel. Sarah was able to walk again because of Sarah's encouragement, which gave her the confidence to go after her dream of signing with a modeling agency, as Quentin rejoiced over his daughter's accomplishment. He was overcome with gratitude for the young guy who had fulfilled his pledge 20 years earlier. There were rumors that Sarah and Sarah were getting serious about their connection and were romantically involved. Quentin couldn't help but sense that Megan was wishing the pair happiness as he saw them from above. After watching the stories above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. If you enjoyed our video, please like, subscribe, and share our channel. That all about today's stories. See you next time.